I don't know what happened there. Uh, Ms. Buffalo is Sunday Assembly. My name is Keith. I'm the president of uh, Sunday Assembly MSP. Uh, is anybody new here? A couple, couple of newbies. Perfect. Uh, so Sunday Assembly, if you're not aware, it is a secular community focused on living better, uh, wondering more, and helping often. Um, normally I wear a shirt that has those words on it for me, so I don't have to remember them. And we're going to try to start with a, an opening video from uh, Doctor Strange, uh, but we have technical problems. Uh, so I guess we'll open with uh, a meet your neighbor game, and uh, because we're going to be talking about some some more weighty material later on, we're going to start with what are your sub fun plans for the summer. So I'm going to table, or I might have to hop tables just to uh, talk for a couple minutes about what you're uh, planning on doing this time. <laughs> Yeah, 
I saw him from the back of his head in a hotel once. I was staying in the same hotel he was, and uh -huh. from a distance, we're right here to the wall. No, so no right here. Right here. Right here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right yeah. Not no okay, yeah. Exactly. So from about here to the back of the wall, that distance, I kind of saw him from, you know, from the back of his head. So like, that is the story. I didn't have a religion. Oh, Dan, I grew up in a very good religion. Oh, you know who they are? Yeah. I know David Bowie did the connecting vocals on one or two of their songs. No, like spirit, rakin, rakin, I started out as that. Okay. Let's, uh, let's reconvene. And, uh, and anyone who wants to share it, and I'm sorry, on the outer edge of the summer plan. Sorry? Does anyone want to share that a particularly fun summer plan? No one's Oh, okay. I'm from Oakland, California. Uh, my fun summer plans are happening right now. Um, I oh. spent the whole week doing um, Prince-related things. So the Fancy Park kind of went on a van tour, saw the sights, went to a dance party for Saturday. It's amazing. That's awesome. Yeah. My mom actually grew up um, in Oakland for part of her childhood. Cool. Anyone else? I'm teaching my first class this summer. Yes. Am I participating in that at all? No, no, that's separate. That's research. That's not true. I'm literally doing nothing fun this summer. I'm working and doing my internship for grad school. Go to the gay grad parade. That's always fun. Yeah. No, it's not. There are too many people. Introverted? I'm like super introvert. So that is that is terrifying to me. I, I marched in a, the San Francisco Library um, with the American Library Association in 2015. Which was okay because like people were here and I was like in the middle. I didn't have to interact with anybody. I just walk literally walk down the street. It was really fun. You don't push yourself beyond your comfort zone where you can't grow up. It's fair point. It's fair point. I've done this sort of thing myself many times for that very reason. Good, good for you. Or you, you. when you just go in the store and you see someone in an aisle and you just go to the next aisle and so like, oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> and there are free t-shirts. That's true, that's true. Um, so speaking of, of pushing out of your head, so that's actually a good segue. Um, that leads to our first song. Um, because we are talking about um, living a good life and having a good death. So, um, where I thought we could start is with a, a funeral song from the first century, the Common Era. Um, so, out of curiosity, does anyone speak Koine Greek? <laughs> a little bit? Good, then I won't butcher, you won't know if I butchered the pronunciation. Um, so I've known, actually known this song for a long time. This was in my first semester of music history class in college. I didn't know what it was about, though. Um, so I'm going to give a try at singing this and then teaching it to you. And then we'll sing it in the translation. Actually, does everyone want to try learning some Greek? Why not? Sure. Pushing through your comfort zone. Okay. The, the microphone is really hot, so it's back a little bit. Um, so it's pretty short, and it goes... Hosson zes venu, medemodos ilipo, prosoligon estitosen, totelos sokronos apeti. Um, so the first line, I'll try singing it and then you sing it. Um, so first line goes, Hosson zis fenu, Hosson zis fenu, Meden holosi lipo, Meden holosi lipo, Prosoligon estitosen, 
Prosoligon esti tosen, totelos so chronos apeti, totelos so chronos apeti. Try to play fast, I don't know. Totelos so chronos apeti. The whole thing? Okay. How about the English version now? Let's try the Greek, the Greek okay. one more time. Um, Possonsis fenu merien holosi lipou prosoligon estitosen totelos sopranos apeti. And here is what we just said. While you live, shine on. Live your life without looking back We're only here for a short while And everything comes to an end One more time? While you live, shine on Live your life without looking back We're only here for a short while Yeah. 
try to three. See if it works. We have the highest per capita expenditures. We have the highest suffering, pain, depression, and more often than not, they die sooner. How can this be? Really, the United States of America has the greatest healthcare system on the planet. We spend 10 times more on these patients than the second leading country in the world. That doesn't make sense. But what we know is out of the top 50 countries on the planet with organized healthcare systems, we rank 37th. Former Eastern Bloc countries and Sub-Saharan African countries rank higher than us as far as quality and value. Something I experience every day in my practice and I'm sure something many of you on your own journeys have experienced. More is not more. Those individuals who had more tests, more bells, more whistles, more chemotherapy, more surgery, more whatever, the more that we do to someone, it decreases the quality of their life. And it shortens it most often. So what are we going to do about this? What are we doing about this? And why is this so? You know, the grim reality, ladies and gentlemen, is that we, the healthcare industry, wrong white coat physicians, are stealing from you. Stealing from you the opportunity to choose how you want to live your lives in the context of whatever disease it is. We focus on disease and pathology and surgery and pharmacology. We miss the human being. How can we treat this without understanding this? We do things to this. We need to do things for this. because then you can communicate with your ancestors and all that good stuff. It's just all natural and real. But here, as a sociologist, I think you'll agree, right, that 
uh, death in this country actually started about the time I, I was born in 1940, back then. 80% of the people died at home uh, fairly quickly, surrounded by loved ones. And the other 20% were, you know, involved in a uh, tractor turnover, lightning strike, or drowning, or some, something like that, and they ended up in the hospital. So let me know when you want me to, to move to the slide, to the slide, so you have to move, you know. I will, I will. I just wanted to say, basically, that well, what you prepared here just fits like that, that's what I, I like to talk about. Let's see that first slide. Um, the slogan, right? You said it, live better. Did I get that right? Help often and, and wonder more? First two parts of that is what we're all about. We feel living better means that your life is full and rewarding. And at the end, the last age inevitable end of it is also going to be something that's meaningful and purposeful for you on your own terms. And help often. There are hundreds of thousands of people around this country who are experiencing what they call intolerable suffering with, and it's hopeless and, and pointless because there's no, only one end in sight and they're just being kept in that mode. Um, going back to the Greeks, Sophocles, the uh, philosopher, writer, said the worst thing is not to die, but to want to die and not be allowed to die. I think he was right on. There are a lot of people in that condition. Next slide. So, that's it. Have a good life and have a good death. And both are possible, but they don't happen automatically in this country anymore. Like the TED Talk physician was saying. Huh? So why is that? What can we do about it? Uh, dignity. This whole movement started in the 80s and it's been called Death of Dignity. It's been called Right to Die Movement. And uh, I'll get a little more into why it's called those things. Our opponents call us a lot of other stuff too. But let's go to the next slide here. It started, uh, how many of you are familiar with the Hemlock Society? Really? Okay. Uh, your age group is, uh, usually doesn't raise that, their hands about this. Uh, it takes its name, of course, from um, Socrates, who chose hemlock rather than uh, give in to the power establishment uh, about his freedom of expression, basically. And uh, that's what this plant is, and that's the symbol of our organization. And it started uh, in 1980, and uh, Final Exit Network is a successor to that organization. Next slide. And this is what started the whole thing. Um, Derek Humphrey is a British journalist, author, writer, and um, his wife was in this kind of a situation. And she asked him, please, can you help me get some relief, you know? Uh, she said, deliverance. Can you help me get some deliverance from this uh, pain? And there was nothing that the medical people could do anything about it. She just had to keep suffering. So he actually helped her by giving her uh, access to some meds that she was able to take. I don't think he gave them. He didn't administer to her. She had to self-administer. But, uh, and then he wrote a book about this. And it caused a huge uh, shock and, and sensation. Uh, and then he came to the United States and wrote this book. Uh, it's in its about fifth edition now, New York Times bestseller for many years. And the thing that triggered all the controversy and started the movement was that word practicalities. In the book, in addition to the whole philosophical, ethical, moral issues, all the alternatives that you should consider, um, to not do something uh, that uh, you can't regret, but it's a one way street, right? Uh, but it had a chapter in there, still has a chapter on practical ways that someone who is in that mode, what they can do to end their own life uh, on their own, uh, on their own terms. And 
Derek is still on the board. Uh, crotchy the old guy who lives out in Oregon, where they do have a law that allows him to have access to those kinds of physician assistants. Um, for 20 years now, they've had a law in operation out there. Uh, next slide. So, the idea is, how should we die? And I think that's a totally individual choice. In Oregon, of all places, my uh, sister-in-law, mountain climber, rescue team leader, cave explorer, just wiry, strong woman, said, I don't want to die uh, fast. I want to experience this whole thing. And she was in a hospice, and her body was so strong, it took her a hell of a long time to die. And we kept saying, sure you don't last? You know, up the, the morphine and the drip. And she says, no, no, i got to experience this. So I respect that decision, too, because it's hers. It's informed, you know. She had all of her marbles at that point still. And so, go for it, Marty, right? But, if somebody in the other situation, I would respect their decisions, too. That's why um, I think we should think about end of life. Um, these terms, beauty, care, respect, are key. Out in Oregon, just uh, FYI, uh, when they passed the law, they said you have to interview people about what they like and don't like about dying, right? Interesting. And they have this whole list of questions. And every year, they get the same kind of answers. People don't uh, have... Fear of death is not... They're never up on the upper end. Pain, even, is not. What's up there, every time, is loss of personal autonomy choice. All these other people are telling me what to, has to happen to me. Right? And that really is the main pushback from people who are actually going through the experience of dying. Uh, and then dignity. was You always, I think, every single time has been number two. That you treat it like a child or like a person who uh, is not competent to, to say what happens to your very own life. Isn't that interesting? So that's why the care and respect comes in. Whereas the doctors, interesting, huh? So uh, Stanford Medical School, my old alma mater, uh, did a uh, survey in 2013 of 1,881 physicians and said, how do you want to die? And as insiders, right, who run these hospitals and, and uh, ICUs and so on, they, they really know what the whole drill is in reality, right? Uh, and so here are the results of that survey. Do you get it? If they are uh, in a terminal situation, like the fellow said, the, the physician said in, uh, on the TED Talk, uh, they don't want any of that crap that we all have to have. No CPR, you know, no code, they call it. Uh, no ventilation, no dialysis, no exploratory surgery, no, you know, none of all that stuff. Zero. Ninety percent is up here. You know, so almost all of them say, we don't want to have that happen to us. But when you get to the drugs, you're back up to 90 percent again, right? That's the reality. And I've given this talk many, many places, and sometimes there are physicians, and they say, well, just a minute, just a minute. It's not our fault. It's the system that the patient, the family, and we are in. It's the medical system, uh, the, uh, I would call it the pharmaceutical medical uh, dying uh, syndrome we've got going here, complex. Uh, next slide shows how actually we do. This pretty uh, current statistics also from uh, Stanford. 80% um, of the people do want to die like we did in, when I was born in 1940. But in reality, all, a large number of us die in places 
hooked up to all these tubes and stuff like this poor soul. So, um, and only 20% end up at home. Um, and that takes a lot of effort to get to that happen. So, the doctors. I'll tell you about my doctor. I was testifying in front of the legislature last year to try to get a death of dignity law passed. And as I've gone on about your right and all that stuff. A few minutes later, uh, 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 another guy got up and he said, we physicians are not killers and we're sworn to protect life, not to take life, and blah, blah, blah. I said, my God, I recognize that guy. That's my cardiologist. <laughs> and I said, afterwards, I said, hey man, you know, when I tell you to turn this defibrillator off, will you do it? And he says, well, <clears throat> I'm a, I go to a Catholic church three times a week. I raise money for a Catholic uh, uh, lawmaker, you know, a politician. And I said, well, will you do it? And I actually had a meeting at his office. Uh, the whole point was, you know, here's my advanced directives. Are you going to honor them or not? He, I finally pushed him to the wall and he said, if I can't do this, my morals, my Catholic morals don't allow me to do this, I'll refer you to somebody. Most people say, get a new cardiologist, right? But I'm in there trying to maintain this dialogue. I hope that it doesn't go off soon. Anyway, yeah. Uh, <laughs> there we go. So, back to the whole question. Whose right is it? Who owns your life? And uh, you said that uh, uh, someone important to you said it's God's decision, right? Uh, no one has a right to take your life. And I have a brother-in-law and a sister married to him, and they uh, down south, um, a preacher, Baptist kind of folks, evangelicals. And they would give me, they do give me a lot of pushback. I've invited them to come to New Orleans where I'm talking down there. And uh, I think they'll like that as much as the dinosaur bone I sent them for Christmas. But anyway. <laughs> anyway. anyway, that's a sidebar. Let's go back to the owner. Uh, I, uh, uh, the previous slide. Yeah, I, I like that slide a lot because it shows the three opponents of this whole right to die. Um, Death of dignity, death by your own choice. Um, it's the politicians who uh, uh, are manipulated by certain interest groups. Um, religious, there's a great priest, and there's a medical institution that's making big, big bucks out of the last two months of your life. 40% of your entire Medicare expenses in your whole life get used up or I should say profited from in the last uh, eight weeks of your life. And it's a, it's a hockey stick. The last two weeks have really sucked the money out of it. So this creates billions. I think it's all right, uh, $34 billion. And that's, a, that's a huge pile of money and it produces all kinds of vested interest in keeping you in that situation. That has nothing to do with you. Well. And, you know, it's not for your benefit to put it that way, right? Uh, I don't like this slide because it looks like me in that big <laughs> protest at the very end. Let's go on. Um, so, politicians in our state, we tried to pass the law last year, and we were getting it out of committee, it was going to go for a vote, and then one politician got leaned on by the Catholic Church and switched his vote, and so rather than lose, in, in, in committee, uh, we withdrew it, and it'll be it's up again next year. Change the name of it. It's called uh, End of Life Options Act to focus on the idea that these are options you should have, right? Yeah. In that case, then your your three interest groups on the last slide should you add a fourth one for possibly family? Family is a whole other issue. Um, oh, I see that there's no best financial interest group. Well. Hey, no, here's the problem. The doctors say one of our reasons that our hands are tied is that the patient who is dying and the family aren't always on the same page. And when that happens, we have nothing that we can do except follow the legal 
uh, protocol of uh, the medical institution we're working for. We have no choice. We would prefer. No yeah, choice. Sure. What? I would say victim because if they want to take their life and then sign them, I would call them a victim. If the victim cut off contact with the family and the family suddenly shows up, you have no way of proving that they have bad relations. Why should the family be able to decide what's in their best interest when the victim already chose that their the family isn't in their best interest at all? Exactly. What that's why our organization invests a lot of time doing workshops on how to put together a vast directive. And then uh, it's called a medical power of attorney. Someone who's there to defend what you wanted, even if you know you're not, you're too drugged up or, or uh, not competent, not even awake. Or a really good example would be that the family is highly religious, and it's this individual who decided to leave that religion. That's at least I've seen that a lot. Yeah, it happens, and a lot of times if there's that ambiguity, the, the uh, hospital disregards the uh, advance directive uh, because they're afraid that someone's going to say you guys killed my mommy and all kind of stuff and uh, so that's why in addition to having a really good up-to-date advance directive regardless of your age and a good solid medical power of attorney someone who's really I chose the bossiest daughter you know I've got two daughters and she is always extremely in charge, in your face kind of person. I made sure she was going to be advocating for me when I'm in that bed. Yeah? But you need to do these kinds of things. Um, there are other things called pulsed, a physician's order to cease medical treatment. That only can happen once you're actually in the hospital and you can get your doctor to sign that. There's a DNR thing. I was uh, at one of our meetings and yeah, Shouldn't there be some type of placement to make sure that the family can't... Because I know that if a family member dies in like a procedure or surgery, the family can sue because that person died. Yeah. Shouldn't there be some type of uh, protections against... Or, or, I'm sorry, for the hospital so that the family can't sue if they decide that they want to take their life? Yeah. Uh, that's a little bit ambiguous. Uh, it varies from state to state, and if it's a Catholic medical institution, forget it. Because the medical institution itself will not even consider your wishes. That should not really be a thing, because there should be separation of church. God, you've used that word should four times already. <laughs> <laughs> well, my, my irreverent old uh, rancher, Uncle Art, said, should in this hand and in the other and see which one gets filled first, you know? It's, it's, it's like, this is why we're fighting for this right. Yeah. But anyway, the, if the population, that's the, the trend line by Gallup polls, uh, last year in this state, 73% of the people agreed with us. Why don't the politicians listen? Why don't they write those laws? Because they get money from Right, right. Um, I don't have a slide on it here, but uh, there was an evangelical uh, uh, organization last year in the South. They said, well, I wonder how our people are, you know, uh, thinking about these issues. And they did a survey and they found out that 48% of evangelicals are in favor. Almost 70% of Catholics not church people, but the, the, the people themselves are in favor of this. It kind of blew their minds and, 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 and made them fairly nervous because in addition to the general public, even the religious part of our uh, society is saying, hey, this is not compassionate, this is not caring, this is uh, exploitation. It has happened in our country. Death first got to be uh, um, cosmetic. You've been to a, you know, a real funeral that's run by the funeral industry. Generates a lot of money and a lot of smells and flowers and euphemisms. People don't pass. I mean, die, they just pass. I always say, pass what, you know? But uh, it's all part of this death taboo plus the commercialization of it. And then the hospitals and the medical institutions. Uh, 
it's a huge sucking money machine uh, that we've created. And I don't blame the doctors so much because what happens is that, uh, Stanford did another survey and what actually happens to doctors is that in a majority of cases they end up like the rest of us going through that system themselves even though they know it's terrible and wrong. They go to hospice a lot quicker and they use much more pain meds than we do. But uh, it, it's even difficult for them to get out of this system. So here's a picture around the country. We just got uh, a law passed in um, Colorado. So Oregon was first, Washington came soon thereafter. Last year, California, and this year, um, um, Colorado. New Mexico passed it in the legislation, uh, legislator, sure, but uh, the Supreme Court got leaned on by certain interests and put the whole thing on hold, so it's an illegal limbo. In Montana, uh, they, they, they passed a law that says it's your business. Uh, no doctors can be convicted for helping you die if that's what you want to do. So it's kind of a different approach. They don't have a you know, physician-assisted suicide, they call it, in these other states. And, uh, of course, um, Maine and Washington, D.C. passed it, but the conservatives in uh, Congress can't, can't overrule that. And they didn't get it together in time, a few distractions maybe, to stop it. There was a time period. So it went into, into force, but now they say, well, yeah, but we're not going to give you a dime to implement this terrible, terrible law. So there we are, nationally. Uh, as I mentioned, it'll be up again next year. It will be called the End of Life Options Act. And uh, if you feel that this is an important issue for you or some family members, it's uh, worth fighting for. Next one. So, and you could join us. You don't have to be my age to be in our organization. Um, we. Um, uh, it's 50 bucks a year to be a member. That gives you, uh, we take that 50 bucks and send it to uh, the Living Well National Registry. And that is, it costs 50 bucks, so it's a wash. And what they can do is upload your advanced directives and medical power of attorney to this database. So if you're out in Colorado skiing and hit a tree or, you, you know, wherever you are, anybody there's a little card in your wallet and a little sticker on your driver's license and they can just scan that and download your final wishes. Uh, uh, AR room can do that anywhere. So we make that as a kind of a uh, inducement to get people both to get their stuff on record and make it uh, uh, zero cost. Yeah. I'm just curious, if my salary relates to the question, but that card that doesn't happen to be very heat resistant, does it? Uh, mine is just plain paper, but I've laminated it. Heat resistant, if you cra have a car cat crash, or an airplane crash, crash. Lightning strike, a lot of situations of high heat that can do it. Yeah. Um, person alive, you have unrecognizable burn. Well, then you wouldn't be worried about <laughs> dying. <laughs> 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 you could still be alive. Oh, I see, yeah. Well, in addition to that, of course, you should keep a copy at home. I've delivered one to my cardiologist. I'm going to do it to my other doctor, you know. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Uh, read this book, but get the uh, most uh, uh, up-to-date version of it. It's in, it's in public libraries and so on, and uh, any bookstore, you can get it online on Amazon. Uh, but the most recent... Uh, uh, the technology uh, for how to off yourself has changed over the years, and you don't want to do it wrong because it could be dangerous to your health. You know? <laughs> so, uh, and this is what I've been pushing for. You know, you don't have to. I think uh, anybody, regardless of their age, should have thought this through, talked it through with the family, so you don't get into those situations. And and. Uh, 
Um, that's an important conversation. The next slide here is our website address, and you've got it there. I urge you to uh, check it out, see, you know, uh, peruse through all the different pages and see if it floats your boat, and if there's somebody in your family that needs to know about this, uh, you can um, do a little link there. It's, uh, we're, we're uh, about 3,000 members nationally, uh, entirely volunteer. We have two part-time paid employees that keep the books and, and uh, run the website, you know, for us. And that's it. Everybody else is doing this as a labor of love, personal commitment. Um, and we're getting a little long in the teeth, tooth, you know. Uh, I bet the average age in our group is 65, 68, something like that. And uh, I'm, I'm on the board, and, and the thing I'm into is outreach. We need to reach a new uh, generation of folks to make sure that there's, this message continues to resonate and we've got this momentum going. Public's with us, no problem. So if we just get a little smarter and work harder, we might get more states to come on board. Now, one thing about that, even in Oregon, where they have this law for 19, 20 years now, uh, you have to be uh, designated it by two physicians independently that you're going to die in six months. You know, that's what they call terminal. And they have all kinds of other restrictions there. Uh, witnesses and people who aren't family members to uh, profit from your death have to sign on and all that kind of stuff. A lot of things to jump through. But there are tens of thousands of people in Oregon who are dying not fast enough and not with the right conditions. Uh, you mentioned, you know, mental capacity and other kinds of ways. Uh, so that's why we will help people directly without regard to the law. And that gets us into legal trouble. Do I have time to just say one more thing? Okay. Here in the state of Minnesota, let's back up. Uh, what we stand for and what we fight for gets us into legal battles all over the place. And we have great legal counsel, a former ACLU lawyer who joined us a few years ago. He's a believer in all this stuff, but he's also a great lawyer. And uh, we've gotten the um, state of Georgia about four years ago, five years ago, in a sting operation. They pretended to have uh, joined, you know, joined us falsely. Uh, they had a guy do that. And then they sent in a uh, 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 false medical records and then went through all of our medical committee and they made a really great case why this person qualified. And so the next step would be for us a lot of phone consultation and counseling. And the next step is to send out what we call exit guides. These are people who have the guts to go out and actually sit with people and deal with them face to face. And we send out an exit guide who happened to be a physician. And they jumped out and said, gotcha. Because in Georgia, you know, that's against the law. That's assisting in the suicide. And they took all of our computers. They took all of our bank account. They nabbed uh, this guy and, and uh, two other people. And uh, so we went to court. And we got not only our stuff back eventually, uh, but we got that entire law thrown out by the Supreme Court of Georgia unconstitutional. We've done that in uh, Arizona and uh, another state I can't recall. So we're out there fighting for this legally as well as other ways. But the prosecutor in Georgia was so pissed off. Uh, she put together a CD with all the internal records of our organization, all the cases, and sent it out to like-minded prosecutors around the country. And one of them happens to be in Dakota County. His name is Jim Baxter. That's my county. That's where I live. And he found out about a woman named Doreen Dunn, who joined the organization in uh, 2005. Not if you're on, the, you know, insiders. I don't know if it's illegal. We couldn't sue him over that. 
But what happened was that then they, uh, this guy in, in Minnesota found out that Doreen Dunn had joined our organization, had gone through this whole process, and had ended her own life using information in the book. And they nailed us for speech. That's how they worded it. Speech that enabled a person to use information to take their own life. That's assisting a suicide in the state of Minnesota. Their own state in the union. And we went to court. We lost in Dakota County. We went to the uh, appellate court and court of appeals. They said, uh, uh, you don't have standing because the state, the, the, the county was uh, in, enforcing the law as it's written. And the Supreme Court here said, we don't want to hear this. We don't want to deal with it. So now we have just prepared a brief to go to the U.S. Supreme Court. They only take a small percentage of cases. We're going to give it a shot. Because speech, think about it. What, specifically what we did wrong, according to the law, is we get the website address, which I just did to you, where you can get this book. That was the, 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 the key. And I'm done, but uh, we're all going to be done someday. <laughs> and I hope that you folks will, uh, you know, think about this in terms of good life and good death. Thank you. Uh, I have my cards back here. Help yourself if you want one uh, for email or a phone. Whatever. Oh, and one more thing, sorry. I've got three different newsletters there in case you want to give them to somebody to look at. I just want to say quickly, as a woman in America, I think um, the right to choose you know, medical care is an important thing for all of us. So thank you, Gary. That was a wonderful presentation. Shadows are falling and I'm running out of breath Keep me in your heart for a while If I leave you it doesn't mean I love you any less Keep me in your heart for a while when you get up in the morning and you see that crazy sun, keep me in your heart for a while. There's a train leaving nightly called when all is said and done. Keep me in your heart for a while. Sha la 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 Keep me in your heart for a while. Sha la 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 Hold me in your thoughts, take me to your dreams, touch me as I fall into you. When the winter comes, keep the fires lit, and I will be right next to you. Engine drivers headed north to the pleasant stream, keep me in your heart for a while. These wheels keep on turning, but they're running out of steam. Keep me in your heart for a while.
Sorry. Um, I just want to say, this is a wonderful song and I really wanted to sing it today. It's a little difficult for me. Um, a couple of years ago, my mom passed away from Parkinson's, and this song really reminds me of her. And, you know, everything Gary said today means it's kind of becoming very personal in that way. Um, because she was, I would say she was really lucky that she had family around her that wanted to help her in whatever way that was.
and Gina can never back down. Tomorrow's getting harder, make no mistake. Love ain't even lucky, and you make your own breaks. It's my life.